So let me thank the organizer for all the work that they have been doing, they're still doing for this conference. Thank you for having me here. So I'm going to present to you a proposal on how to consider fiction, which uh, I didn't find in the literature and I find promising, and I want to see your reaction to it. So uh, let me first of all say I, I'm going to present, uh, to organize my presentation. First of all, I'm presenting my proposal. Then I will uh, very shortly compare it with uh, other theories. And finally, I will try to show that there are some consequences of my proposal that, in my opinion, are interesting concerning alleged assertions in fiction and fictional content. Um, so let me start with uh, uh, my, sorry, my proposal. I propose to consider fiction as a communicative act in which conformity to the truth is suspended. That's the idea. So you see there are two components in my proposal that fiction is a communicative act. The act allows for communication. This is not distinctive of fiction, obviously, but it is, uh, I, I think, a characteristic of fiction. And then it is uh, characterized by suspension of the commitment to conform to the truth. And this is uh, the distinctive characteristic of fiction according to my proposal. So first of all, I want to say something about what I mean by suspension of the commitment to conform to the truth. And then I will try to say something about what I intend by communication. In order to uh, understand the suspension of the commitment to truth, it may be worth, first of all, to say something about commitment to truth, and in particular to what Paul Grice said about commitment to truth. As you all know, according to Paul Grice, our communicative exchange is governed by the cooperative principle, according to which we make our we should make our conversational contribution such as it is required by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. According to Grice, uh, our the cooperative principle is governed by a series of maxims and super maxims, which are divided into four categories. I'm particularly interested in the category of quality which as a super maxim, try to make your contribution one that is true and two more specific maxims, do not say what you believe to be false and do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence. And uh, there are two, at least two important cases which is useful to consider. There are cases in which our conversation, uh, in which our uh, the cooperative principle and the maxim are respected in our conversations and there are cases in which the cooperative principle is respected and the maxim, at least the maxim, is flouted and exploited. What is relevant here is that in order for a, uh, that in both cases, the maxims are in, cha in charge. So we respect the maxim because they are in charge, but even when they flout the maxim, they flout the maxim because they are in charge and we can exploit it because they are in charge. Now, what is the assumption behind Grice's idea? Uh, I think that a relevant uh, quotation is the one you see in this slide. What uh, Grice writes is the conversational maxims and the conversational implicatures connected with them are specially connected, I hope, with the particular purposes that talk and so talk exchange is adapted to serve and is primarily employed to serve. So the idea is that the conversational maxims are connected to the primary purposes of communication. In particular, considering the maxims of quality, I think that obviously Grice is correct that for assertive talk and assertive talk exchange, the maxims of quality reflect the primary purpose of communicating truth. What I want to claim to try uh, to consider is that and my, purpose, uh, my proposal is that this purpose is suspended within fiction, namely that people communicate without being committed to the truth. And in this sense, fiction is non-assertive communication. Now, what does it mean to suspend commitment to the truth? It doesn't mean uh, 
that the author should say something false or should say something connected to something false or so connected to something which might be false. It means that the maximum of quality are not a commitment of the author. The idea is that the author of fiction may produce a work which is true, uh, but she cannot claim responsibility for the truth of what she has produced, nor she can be considered to be responsible for the truth of what she has produced. And uh, the author of fiction may produce obviously a work which is false or partially false, but this cannot be considered to be his fault. So suspending the maximum of quality as I'm trying to present uh, to uh, defend this is the suspension of the commitment to truth suspension of the responsibility for truth and falsity on the side of uh, the author of fiction. Um, if that is the case, uh, there is an interesting, I think, uh, connection between fiction, assertion, and truth. So the way I'm trying to defend the fiction uh, uh, as characterized by suspension of the conformity to truth is the following. A work or an utterance is fiction, if and only if it is a communicative act produced with a word suspension of the commitment to truth. And uh, let me try to say something. If there were not an intersubjective truth, there would not be assertions. Because assertion, however we define assertion, which is itself a, um, a topic of debate, uh, assertion is committed uh, to truth somehow. So if there were not truth, there would not be assertions. And uh, what I add is that if there were no assertions, there would not be fiction, because fiction requires to suspend a commitment which is characteristic of assertions. So fiction requires to suspend a crucial normal for assertion and the crucial uh, normal of, of assertion presupposes truth. That's the idea. A consequence of my proposal is that fiction may be any act, meaning any communicative act, which has a truth committed counterpart. So written text may be fiction, spoken talk may be fiction, theater may be fiction, Poetry may be fiction, and also paintings may be fiction if we consider that uh, painting may be truth committed, should represent uh, at least what appears to us. May it also, whenever this commitment is suspended, it may be fiction. Now, supposing that uh, uh, Fiction is characterized by the suspension of the commitment to truth. Now, what is communicated through fiction? That's the question. And what I want to uh, try to uh, argue, or at least to defend, is the idea that what is communicated is not a representation of a subject independent reality. But what is communicated is the presentation of a subject dependent reality. Let me try to tell you something about this idea. So let's consider a painting. Uh, on the uh, bottom side, we see a painter who is truth committing. He tried to reproduce what he sees in front of him. On, on the bottom side, we see instead a painter who is trying to produce something which has in mind. Doesn't matter whether it's true or false, what is, is presenting something through the painting. Now, let me now try to consider what happens when we look at the painting. What I want to uh, try to defend is that the phenomenological experience is exactly the same when we consider a truth committed painting or non-truth committed painting but the cognitive attitude changes. And uh, I, I thought uh, to give you an example. This is a painting, very famous painting. Uh, it is made by a known artist. We do not know who was the author of this painting, but we know the title of the painting, which is The Ideal City. 
So when we look at the painting, we may draw on our background beliefs and uh, realize that the painting is uh, clearly made in the Renaissance time because the architecture is really uh, typically Renaissance style. And uh, also if we consider the fact that there is a cross on, on the top of uh, the round building in the center of the square, we may infer that it is a religious painting. But there is also something different that we may consider and which can, we cannot avoid considering that there are no human beings, no animals around. There are just trees, but no human beings and no animals. And uh, let's try to consider this characteristic of the painting. If the painting were representational, we would ask, where did people have gone? What happened to them? Are they sleeping? Did they go away? Did they flew away? But as long as we consider it as fiction, as the representation or the presentation of an ideal city, we may start to consider what did the painter want? Why did the painter present us a square, an empty square? What did he want to present to us? What did he want to communicate to us? And uh, we may go on uh, to consider the painting within this attitude. For example, we may see that there is uh, an half open door of the religious building at the center of the square. And we may also consider what did they, did they want to uh, communicate to us through it. So the attitude changes, as you see. What I, I want, I try to say is that whether we think that the painting is representational, we have a certain attitude. If we think that it is fiction or it is a presentation of the ideal city as it is, we have a different attitude. So what uh, is communicated uh, or the content is to be looked to, uh, for in what is presented and in the explanation for what is presented. And the viewers use the painting to make inferences to the best explanation of what was communicated to them. And they do that uh, using some instruments. Uh, among the instruments used, there are background beliefs shared at the time of the production, possible connections among the elements presented, and also the emotional reactions to what is presented. We try to, for example, consider what is the emotional reaction the empty square producing us. And the idea is that whenever we consider a, a written fiction, the things are quite similar. So we have truth committed writing and non-truth committed writing. The phenomenological experience when reading doesn't change very much, but the cognitive attitude we have towards um, changes, whether we consider it to be fiction or non-fiction. So uh, the general idea I'm trying to defend uh, is the following. So uh, is that a work or an utterance is fiction if and only if it is a communicative act produced with a word suspension of the commitment to truth. And uh, by suspension of the commitment to truth, I intend that there is no responsibility on the side of the author towards truth or falsity of what is presented. And this is actually what is accepted also by the receivers of the fiction. And uh, what is communicated is to be looked for in the reasons for what is presented. That's the idea. So this is the idea I want to try to consider with us. So I think that this idea is quite different from the other, the main theories which are present in the literature. I, I know that there are even more than that, but uh, I, I want to be short about that because I'm more interested about the consequences of my proposal. So I will consider the pretense theory on the one side and we'll try to show you not just the difference between my proposal and uh, what is claimed by a, a defender of the pretense theory. And I will consider the imagination center theories in a whole and I will try to explain you the main difference between my approach and their approach. 
So let's start with the pretense theory. The main thesis of uh, pretense theory states that, first of all, fiction is pretense, namely the author of fiction pretends to communicate. That's the idea of the, uh, of the supporter of the uh, theory. And on the second, uh, uh, second axis, it's the content of fiction is representational. Namely, it is what it would be true if the fiction were told as a known fact, as we, as Lewis says, and other uh, philosophers accepted. According to my proposal, what I'm trying to defend is fiction is communication. So it is not pretense, but it is communication with the suspension of the commitment to truth. Um, and the content of fiction is a presentation of element with a goal to be found through inferences to the best explanation. So I will try to tell you something about the, def the difference between a repre the representational notion of content and the presentational notion of content I'm trying to propose to you later on. Now, concerning the imagination center theory, there is a there are a lot of theory and they are quite different among themselves. I'm, I, so, uh, I know that uh, uh, what I say is definitely uh, very short about, uh, on that, but let me just try to uh, present to you the main difference between the imagination center theory and my proposal. According to the imagination center theories, a characteristic of fiction is that its content is imagined. And I agree with that, uh, that uh, what I try to say is that the distinctive characteristic of fiction is the way in which imagination is constrained. And the way it is constrained is, as I told you, it is constrained by the fact that uh, it is communication within suspension of the commitment to truth. That's uh, the general idea. So, uh, let me go to the last part about the consequences of my proposal, which have to do with assertions and the way in which uh, uh, content is interpreted. So let me repeat again uh, my definition of fiction. Uh, a work or an utterance is fiction if and only if it is a communicative act produced with the word suspension of the commitment to truth. So, as I told you, commitment to truth is a, an essential characteristic of assertion. So it is, seems to be really a problem for my theory. How can I account for assertions within fiction? And uh, even if uh, there is a long debate about assertions within fiction, it is not easy to find an example of assertion of, uh, within fiction, which uh, uh, all philosophers tend to agree on. But Let's take this one, the beginning of Tolstoy Anna Karenina, as a, an example which may be taken as an assertion within fiction. All happy families resemble one another, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So how can I account for that? What I want to say is that there are three possible ways to treat such uh, uh, sentences uh, which are compatible with my proposal. I think that the third one is more convincing, at least in most cases, but the other two are still compatible with my proposal. The first alternative is just to repeat what Gregory Carey said about them, saying he say that a work of fiction is a patchwork of fictional and non-fictional utterances. Authors are sometimes committed to truth when they make assertions, sometimes non-committed to truth when produce, producing fictional utterances. This is compatible with my proposal. And if you think, for example, that when Tolstoy brought that sentence, he thought to have enough evidence to just assert it, then this is probably the way to go. The second alternative is uh, to say that the author of fiction may sometimes adopt an ambiguous attitude. Let me try to be clear about this ambiguity. 
by an ambiguous attitude, I'm saying that it's not clear whether it's a certain or non a, or a fictionalizing uh, their utterance. I'm not claiming that an author can both suspend and commit into truth and be committed to truth at the same time. That's obviously, this is not something which an author of fiction can do, but he may live indeterminate which attitude is adopting. And in extreme cases, the author can be happy to adopt both attitudes. Uh, I, I took from Stacy Friend this example of Mark Sandino, who published two of his books as nonfiction in US and as fiction in Europe. So it is possible that an author is happy to adopt different attitude toward the same text. But the third alternative is the one which I consider interesting. And in my opinion, in many cases in which what are alleged assertions should, uh, in fiction uh, should be considered. Then they should be considered, in my opinion, as non-assertive communicative acts. And if we consider, for example, this example from Tolstoy, um, well, in my opinion, this is my opinion, obviously. It also did not expect to give us a, a general rule or general definition of happy and unhappy families, but wanted to introduce us to the fiction, uh, want to give us a key to interpret the fiction. If we think about the fiction, unhappiness and unhappiness families uh, um, are actually uh, part of the fiction, there is a clear difference between the unhappy or, uh, of the family of Anna's brother and the unhappiness of the family of Anna herself. So uh, it is possible that uh, Tolstoy wanted to focus the attention of the reader to unhappiness, unhappiness within families in order to introduce uh, the reader to the fiction and not make it really an assertion. And if we assume that when uh, an author of fiction, um, what is uh, making fictional utterances is non-committed to truth, that's what he can do, obviously. Now, let me uh, just consider the, la uh, the last consideration, which is has to do with the content of fiction, which is compatible with my proposal. So I'm trying to, uh, compare a uh, presentational notion of the content of fiction to the re standard representational notion of the content of fiction, which is the one which is defended by Lewis, Walton, and many, and this, the dominant way to interpret the content of fiction. Um, according to the representational notion of the content of fiction, it is part of the content of fiction, whatever would be true, if the fiction were told as non-fact in situations similar enough to our world, or in situations similar enough to what people believed at the time of the creation. What I'm trying to defend or trying to propose, not defend is too much, but trying to propose is the presentational notion of the content of fiction where it is part of the content of fiction, what is presented and whatever may be inferred to the best explanation of what was communicated through the work itself. Now, there are certain advantages and I want to uh, show you there are a couple of advantages of this way of considering the content of fiction, namely certain problems with the traditional way to consider the content of fiction disappears. First of all, let me consider what I call the puzzling influences. They are taken from Walton and Garcia Carpintero Pearson. The inference which a reader is happy to do. For example, when reading Conrad's The Secret Agent, the reader infers that the death of Miss Mer uh, infers the death of Mrs. Verloc from a newspaper headline. Uh, in reading Silverstein's Leader Gadi, the reader infers that the speaker is sketched by by the fact that the poem stops abruptly. 
And in Cortazar's uh, continuity of parks, the reader infers that the man in the armchair is about to be killed by a character in the novel he's reading through a similarity of details between the environment of the reader and the environment of the fictional character. Now, these are well-known problems for the representational theory of fiction. But if we start to consider the content of fiction as the presentation of certain elements, which requires through inference of the best explanation, what is communicated to us, those inferences seems to be more reasonable or at least definitely reasonable to do. And another aspect which in my opinion, this uh, perspective seems to me promising is considering what are the so-called silly questions. Silly question as a terminology by Walton. Question like, how did Otello come up with such superb verses? How is it that characters speak such a fluent English even when they are not natives? How is it that a shy Elemini Dickinson is so loquacious and uses the bell of Amherst? Or how is it that in Leonardo's Last Supper, all 13 of the diners line up in a row in the same side of the table? Now, those are very well known uh, problems for the traditional theories of um, the content of fiction. And in my opinion, the, uh, the reasons why we consider them silly questions is that those questions presuppose that the fiction represent an independent reality, which follows well-known rules, the rules which we commonly attribute to uh, an independent reality. And the fiction seems to be bad suited to do that. But if we start to consider fiction not as a representation, but as presenting something, we see that the, why the questions are silly. For example, let's consider again the first question. How did Otello come up with such superb verses? This seems, uh, this question depends on the fact that we consider Shakespeare's plays as representing an independent reality. If uh, where Otello doesn't speak uh, uh, as he does in Shakespeare's play. But if we start to consider fiction as a presentation of certain elements, the reasonable question to do is what did Shakespeare want to communicate it, presenting as Otello speaking with such superb verses? And uh, all the other questions seems to have a different uh, so you see that the questions which are silly we, because they uh, assume the representation of notion of fiction can be converted in question more interesting, which depend on the presentation of notion of fiction. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention.